bug. So um, you are with the Partnership for Southern Equity and the Just Communities program um, today for our webinar series. Uh, we'll just give you a little bit of orientation for those who may be new to the series uh, so you know a bit about who we are and, and the work that we do, and then we'll turn the mic over to our speaker. So the Partnership for Southern Equity Equity has been around um, since about 2008, um, started our work in Metro Atlanta and have expanded um, into the, the South and beyond. Um, and the focus is really on advancing racial equity and shared prosperity for all. And we do that in a number of different ways um, through a, a number of different program areas, which we call our portfolios. Um, and I will highlight just real quickly the areas of work that we focus on. Um, just energy, just growth, which is uh, related to democratization of land use and development practices. And that is the part of the organization that hosts the Just Communities Initiative. Our Just Health team focuses on uh, social determinants of health and um, addressing inequities. Just Opportunity is where we do work around economic inclusion, uh, workforce development, um, and educational offering. Um, organizing unit uh, is our community organizing arm. Um, and the impact team is where our, our uh, research and analytics live, as well as our fee-for-service uh, social enterprise uh, just solutions. We have another area of our work which really uh, filters across all the portfolios called Yes for Equity, which is our youth power building uh, team. And we have a an initiative called the Justice 40 Accelerator that is, I believe, wrapping up the third cohort of, of around 50 different um, community-based organizations who are receiving uh, some, some seed funding and technical support to help prepare them to be um, applicants for federal um, infrastructure and Inflation Reduction Act um, programs. So those are some areas uh, where we work. Just Communities, again, is the, the program that has, uh, has evolved over the last couple of years from the seed of eco districts. So many of you may be uh, familiar with eco districts um, here as part of that community or um, participants in some of PSC's other work. I will lift up a little bit of the, the, the why for us for Just Communities and why we, um, we took on the evolution of eco districts. Um, and it really uh, revolves around our, our deep uh, commitment to lifting up these principles that we operate on a radical truth and understanding of history. Uh, we recognize the lasting impact of structural racism. We commit to healing and liberation. We honor the wisdom of neighbors and the power of community. We assert racial equity as the superior growth model. We commit to strategies that facilitate a just climate transition and we leverage public policy for reform, repair, and reconciliation. And if you're interested in reading uh, more of the detail around these principles, we encourage you to go to our website, um, which you can find at justcommunities.info. Um, and there is a, a section in the site that, that talks about the principles and, um, and uh, can give you a place to sign on to these if this is something that, um, that really resonates for you. And these principles are really the undergirding for the evolution of the Eco Districts Protocol, uh, which is has been released uh, this past January. So uh, the Just Communities Protocol 1.0 um, is live now. It's available on our website. Um, we have launched our uh, our new accredited practitioner program, which again built on the work of of Eco Districts and um, and really sort of rethought the curriculum for the credential course based on the new protocol. Um, you will see information on our website uh, this summer relating to new opportunities to register uh, just communities, um, teams that are applying the protocol and seeking certification. And you will also see um, very shortly the, the uh, re-release of an asynchronous self-directed version of the AP credential course. Um, so we have a lot going on, excited to have had, I think our first 125 folks who have gone through the new, uh, new AP course and are joining this growing community of practitioners around the world. 
Um, and we're happy to have an opportunity to, to bring thought leaders um, who were really uh, working on research and, and application of, of big gnarly ideas in this intersection of, of equity issues, of uh, the history of disparities and, and how we start to, to integrate uh, considerations around climate change and climate resilience. Um, with this uh, this history that we we uh, build from today, so we are really excited to um, to bring today our speaker Dexter Locke, who comes to us from uh, USDA Forest Service North Northern Research Station Baltimore Field Station, um, and he has a, a incredible career in urban ecology, um, a, brings a lot of of passion to his work. Um, and, and brings together ideas around urban ecology, urban forestry, spatial data science, um, and, and particularly in this urban and community forestry context, which we know that there is a tremendous amount of work that is really just starting um, as a result of the Inflation Reduction Act funding through uh, USDA that is, is now um, arriving in the field uh, with communities all across the country um, and so chances are uh, folks that are on the line today are going to be hearing more about um, urban and community forestry projects in their area. And uh, we know that that the perspectives that you'll learn today from Dr. Locke will will help you to, to understand maybe the context for that work um, and, and think of ways that you might engage in supporting that work. Um, so uh, I'm, you've got his information here about his uh, experience and degrees. I don't want to um, delay giving him the mic any further. So, um, so with that, I am going to bring my screen share down and allow Dexter to, to go ahead and step in and share his screen and, and share his thoughts. We do have uh, the Q&A function on the webinar available. So please um, start to drop your questions in as you um, as they come to you. And with that, I will uh, I will step back. Dexter, please take it away. Thanks so much, Suzanne, for the background, that intro, and all the work you do at Partnership for Southern Equity. And thanks, Elaine, for extending the invitation um, to this opportunity. As mentioned, I do urban and community forestry research. So I study cities, trees, and the people who steward them. So I think that's going to dovetail nicely with, with some of the uh, the programs and initiatives that, that PSC is engaged in. So I'm gonna talk about three uh, different studies or perspectives on uh, race-based lending and, and redlining, the practice of redlining and urban ecology today. First, a 37 city cross-site analysis of tree canopy by, by different neighborhoods. I'm gonna drill down into Baltimore city where I've done a lot of my, my research and look at street trees and what's growing there and, and what's not growing, again, as it corresponds to redlining. I'm gonna briefly talk about a citizen science bird project that's uh, being extended. Uh, and Elaine asked me to, to tie this into green gentr gentrification and how that relates to, to redlining. And so um, I'm gonna do a little bit of that. So this is the, the Roman numeral level outline and I'm excited to get, get right in. Can you hear me okay? Can you see my slides just before I, I go on for a few minutes? I wanna make sure I'm, I'm all set. Yes, I think you're good to go. Great. So one of the most clear and consistent findings of high resolution tree canopy mapping, so really detailed maps of, of trees when viewed from above in urban areas, is that higher income areas have more tree canopy than their lower income counterparts. That's shown with this meta-analysis on the left. So it's an analysis of all the pertinent analyses looking at tree canopy and income. And similarly, uh, predominantly white communities on the right uh, have tend to have more tree canopy than communities of color. Uh, there are some methodological differences and some exceptions, but these are the most, these are the two most clear and consistent findings at the census block group or census tract the neighborhood scale within our cities, uh, mostly in the US, but in Canadian cities and, and in Europe as well. It was a very clear and consistent finding. Uh, and we're able to see because of the, the advent of high resolution tree canopy mapping. Why am I talking about redlining? 
Well, there's a number of reasons to talk about redlining, but it's not just a, a policy that had lasting impacts on, on communities. It's a, a policy that's relevant to today. In the Chesapeake Bay Trust across the Chesapeake Bay states, a uh, large geographic area actually uh, targets which uh, neighborhoods and community groups are eligible for grant funding. Um, in part, one of the criteria is formerly redlined. And so it's it's not a, an academic subject matter. It's, it's tied to who has access to resource today and eligibility for uh, improvement programs in one of the regions I do most of my research. So a little bit of context, what is redlining? I've, I've mentioned redlining several times, but uh, I haven't defined it till now. So the Homeowners Loan Corporation um, and the Federal Housing Administration is part of the New Deal coming out of the Great Depression. The idea was to categorize neighborhoods into perceived risk for uh, home foreclosure. The idea was that if people couldn't um, pay their mortgages, that it could have catastrophic and rippling effects to an already struggling economy. That that method of uh, wealth accumulation and, and finance would, would be threatened further if people were unable to pay their mortgages. And so the idea was to categorize neighborhoods into four different classes. Uh, a, which was green or considered safest, then in rank order B, C, and D. And D was red on the maps and considered the riskiest place to, to loan, uh, hence the name redlining. It, it's derived from these color-coded maps I'll share in a moment. So the idea uh, was to, to bolster the, uh, the, red, the real estate market. From a research perspective, redlining uh, is very useful um, for helping us to understand how urban areas were formed and social and demographic shifts in the built environment and environmental things like tree canopy. These five characteristics, it was consistent. So the rank order of A, B, C, D had clearly defined criteria. It was, there was a racial component. So from a, a research perspective, it enables us to look at issues of social and, and racial justice. Spatial, because it was literally on the map and through the magic of, of modern uh, geographic information systems and, and mapping technologies, we can augment those maps with other relevant data from census, remote sensing, um, and anything with the latitude and the longitude can be compared. It was applied at the same time, so in the mid to late 1930s, so very quickly, and it was widespread. Uh, 239 of the biggest metropolitan areas in the country were classified by this system. So it gives us a very clear and comprehensive way of understanding about how, uh, what I'll explain more about this race-based and segregationist uh, policy compares to neighborhoods to today. So very convenient from a, from a research perspective, but I wanna be really clear that race-based zoning and segregation had many, many forms, um, practices and programs before redlining, during redlining, since redlining, even though redlining was um, uh, deemed by the Supreme Court to be illegal in 1968, um, many other uh, forms of, of race-based zoning and policies were, were in effect. So to give you an example, this is a map on the right of Baltimore City. And uh, this is Druid Hill Park, where my cursor is. That's one of the parks designed by Frederick Law Olmsted, who designed Central Park and Prospect Park and many other famous um, uh, parks throughout the country. And so using uh, the text description, um, description, quoting from the, the assessment from the Homeowners Loan Corporation, an old residential section seriously threatened with Negro encroachments. A small section along Reisterstown Road consists of fairly modern two-story brick rows, that's short for row homes or townhomes, mixed, some Negroes, some, some owners of longstanding, still occupying old residences, converted apartments containing white-collared, class-skilled mechanics. It delves into the population and racial uh, breakdown and makeup. Favorable features, Druid Hill Park and good transportation. Detrimental features, obsolescence, and Negro encroachment. So 
their words, not mine, quoting from the assessment, you can see very clearly how um, the quality and age of the housing stock, the demographics of the neighborhood, um, uh, also immigrant uh, populations, were all baked into this assessment. So A, B, C, D, and A graded areas were always US born, single family detached, um, white neighborhoods, and, and C's and D's had communities of color and immigrants and so on. And so you can see it's a mix of criteria that, that go into defining these neighborhoods. Baltimore, uh, unsurprisingly uh, to many, has, has a lot of vacancy. And this is this slide's actually um, out of the, um, the vacant homes is lower, it, it, although it's a very hard number to get. It, it's, it's about 13 or 14,000 now. And the vacant lots has increased as vacant buildings are being removed and turned into parks or redeveloped and, and things like that. And on the, on the right, you can see each dot is either a vacant building or a vacant lot. And you can see the very overwhelming preponderance of correspondence between what's a vacant lot or vacant building today and those areas that were classified as, as D or C in the 1930s. Um, so those communities that didn't have those types of, of loans uh, made available were disinvested in C, uh, that disinvestment today. Tangentially related, I've done some research on uh, vacant building removals in Baltimore City. It's a big push to remove the, these hazardous buildings that can conceal crime. Um, and uh, what we found through an analysis over half a decade is that we looked at street segments that had vacant buildings that remained vacant and compared them to otherwise similar street segments that did have vacant building removals. And we found uh, a 1.4% drop in crime and assaults at a 5% decline and a 3% uh, drop in, in violent crimes. And this is a strategy that's complementary with other uh, crime fighting strategies. So we're really excited about that finding that this idea of uh, trying to stabilize the housing market and in some ways undo the effects of redlining has a co-benefit of, of crime reduction and it might have an additive or synergistic effect with other, other strategies um, to reduce crime. So back to redlining, we see scores of studies across many academic disciplines and different study areas. We're looking at redlining is associated with high poverty and unemployment today, low credit scores, uh, low educational attainment and low health. And the literature has really gotten to a point where now there's meta-analyses of this Multiple studies have looked at redlining and social and uh, social outcomes, economic outcomes, health. And I wanted to know, what about environmental things? What about uh, trees and urban areas? Most of my research, as I mentioned, is on urban and community forestry. So trees provide a number of benefits, especially in cities. Uh, they reduce the urban heat island, for, for example, and it's been a hot summer. Uh, I know Atlanta is always quite, quite warm, but heat is uh, the deadliest weather-induced cause of mortality out of any of the hurricanes, tornadoes. Uh, heat consistently is, is number one and has been for 20 years. And it's going to become increasingly lethal with the change in climate. And that, of course, dis disproportionately affects vulnerable populations, the young, the old, those who can't afford air conditioning, and so on. So multiple intersecting uh, types of advantage or disadvantage. Trees also absorb storm water, they provide habitat. There's many, many other benefits or ecosystem services of trees, especially in urban areas. And so we wanted to understand if redlining was related to the spatial distribution of tree canopy today. And if we saw a correlation, we thought there's, there's a couple of plausible explanations. You know, if you put in an address in Google Maps, there's multiple routes to the same destination. Correlation is not causation. So we wanna think about what are the plausible mechanisms that would explain that. So we know A-graded neighborhoods had larger lots, single family detached homes. C and D neighborhoods were denser um, apartments or row homes. So there'd be less space for trees and therefore the benefits they provide. We also know from a lot of great qualitative 
in legal scholarship in, in Baltimore and in some other cities that the location and allocation of street trees and parks, which contain trees and tree canopy, is related to access to power. Certain communities were better able to uh, steer public investments into those amenities, parks and street trees in their neighborhoods, and other neighbors, neighborhoods were less successful in part because of um, social status and, and, and race. So that those are some of the possible explanations that would explain why we see more tree canopy cover in A, gray neighborhoods than B, than C, than D. So that was some of our, our theory and, and background on, on the topic. So how do we do it? This is from a, a paper I published a couple of years ago. We looked at 37 cities for which we had high resolution tree canopy data. And at the time, uh, the University of Richmond, who's been scanning and digitizing and making modern uh, spatial data sets out of those historic paper HOLC maps, hadn't digitized all the cities. They haven't digitized all the cities yet. And at the time, it was a much smaller set. But we had all the cities for which we had really good tree canopy data and all the cities with available redlining data and the overlap of those two lists of cities is how we got to these 37 cities. And so to the left of the dotted line, these are cities with lots of data in terms of many, many neighborhoods defined by the H2LC, Oak, uh, and, and categorized ABCD. And within those, we had, we had enough data that we could do within city analysis, A to B to C to D. And to the right of the dotted line, we were able to include all of those in a cross city analysis. So we could look at all A graded neighborhoods, all B, all C, all D. That's everything on the, that's all the cities. And then on the left of the dotted line, we could, we could scrutinize within the city with enough statistical confidence. I'll just point out that this is, uh, you know, Chicago has fewer people than LA or New York, uh, both now and um, in the 1930s. But that speaks to the, the very block to block nature of the hyper segregation in Chicago, that those neighborhoods were drawn much smaller and consequently there are more of them. So what did we find? What we found is that A graded neighborhoods on, have on average 43% tree canopy today and their degraded counterparts have about half of that, about 22% tree canopy cover on average. If you're new to urban and community forestry, is that a lot, is that a little? I want you to imagine that it's a rainy day I want you to imagine you have 43% of an umbrella. And then I want you to imagine it's a rainy day and you have 22% of an umbrella. Not only is it a statistically significant difference, a difference beyond the realm of chance, but it's really meaningful in terms of the ecosystem services of trees. I'm working on a project on tree canopy and heat. And what we're finding is that 35 to 40% tree canopy cover is when you really get the cooling benefits of trees. So, as we go from no tree canopy to 1%, it gets cooler. And from one to two, it gets cooler. And as we add canopy, more canopy is associated with cooler air temperatures. But when we get up to about 35 to 40%, we get e even, even cooler temperatures, a very precipitous drop in air temperature. So reducing the lethality of, of summer heat waves. We know from some research in Maryland that as watersheds become increasingly urbanized, we're replacing trees with buildings and roads that when we get to about a 35 to 40% tree canopy cover, when we get below that, our streams become significantly impaired. There's a water quality connection. <coughs> Excuse me. Washington DC has a 40% tree canopy goal. 40% um, Baltimore City has a 40% tree canopy goal. Philadelphia has a 30% per neighborhood, so it has to be more equitably distributed. You can't keep all of your canopy in parks and open space. It has to be spread out through the neighborhoods. So it's the formerly A-graded neighborhoods meet or exceed these thresholds for heat island benefits to really, really kick in for, for um, water quality benefits and match the policy goals in many of the, the cities I work in in the mid-Atlantic and Northeast. So it's a big difference. Drilling into uh, 10 of our biggest cities for which we had enough data to do with in-city analysis. What you can see here is that the rank order 
matches A, then B, then C, then D in terms of tree canopy cover. Um, and there's a little bit of an outlier in, in Seattle. These are formerly industrial uh, shipping areas that have become waterfront parks that are, are well used and loved in those communities. So that explains uh, sort of a, a departure from the, from the trend there. But those areas that uh, were classified as A have more tree canopy cover than their, their D graded counterparts. So in summary, trees provide benefits in cities. We had done some qualitative research in Baltimore that had shown that redlining was associated with the location allocation of trees, investments in street trees, and, and where the parks and, and, and things like that were distributed. We wanted to see if that would scale up to a pattern in other cities, and we found yes. There's a couple of, of exceptions. I made that, that point in Seattle. Um, and then we made uh, all the uh, underlying data uh, freely available so other can add on to so that kind of rich qualitative uh, research and, and legal scholarship and anthropologists and so on working on how did that unfold in their cities now that we see similar patterns. I would be remiss if I didn't mention um, at least three other papers have done similar kinds of analyses. They're all published at the same time. This is not a competition. Four research groups, independent, different funding, different sources, using uh, the same redlining polygons, but different measures of trees and tree canopy, um, came to the same conclusion. A, then B, then C, then D. It is very rare to have this, this much and this kind of scientific consensus that four independent teams using four different data sets reach the same conclusion that the A-graded neighborhoods have uh, on average twice as much tree canopy as their, their degraded counterparts today, 80 years later. Uh, they use a, some of them use a coarser measure of tree canopy. So we use a very high resolution so we can pick up all the tree canopy. So using a 30 meter sensor, much coarser, they find about 23% and then down to about 11. Um, so the pattern is the same, it's half, but they're missing quite a bit of canopy. Um, and on the right, we see higher surface temperatures in D than in A, more tree canopy in A than in D, um, and then more impervious surfaces in D than in A. So um, less tree canopy, more impervious surface, more heat, and again, that intersectional social vulnerability, that, that heat is affecting uh, poor, the poorest neighborhoods and, and elderly and those with, with medical vulnerabilities already. So it's, it's a compounding multiple stressors. Uh, so what do I mean by high res tree canopy? This is Central Park, this is Columbus Circle, nice imagery. This is the Landsat data. So uh, my colleagues in other cities use data like this. Um, very good at the, at, at the bigger blocks of canopy. We're missing some here, uh, but the high resolution can, can see through the shadows and pick up individual street trees. Um, this is a six inch map. Uh, the data we used had to be one meter or smaller. So very, very detailed. It's about 900 times more information per, per unit area than, than the Landsat data. So an old Philadelphia assessment showed that uh, they're off by about half, but as shown that the same pattern uh, persists. I'm gonna pivot. So we've been talking about tree canopy in 37 cities, some of the mechanisms, some of the methodological considerations and, and the policy relevance of that. Now I wanna to shift to a, a subset of the urban forest and talk about street trees. The USDA has a food pyramid and I like this nature exposure pyramid. On the left, we've got sort of a spatial scale, neighborhoods, region, regions, countries, international, and on the, the right slope of that pyramid, we have a, like a time scale. And so street trees are, are uh, so the idea is maybe this once in a lifetime kind of uh, um, trip somebody might take, I don't know, uh, climb Mount Everest, but street trees occupy this really important space in our daily exposure to nature. And increasingly my research is at the intersection of epidemiology, environmental health, and what's 
called Exposure Science and how access to nature is improving mental and physical health. But I'm talking about the kinds of green space exposures we have very frequently and at the neighborhood scale. And so street trees are a really important part of that nature exposure um, and um, uh, ex ex nature exposure. Also, uh, typically, there's, there's relatively few players doing street trees in cities. So every city I work in is a little bit different. Um, but there tends to be uh, a city agency tasked with street trees and then often a, a nonprofit partner. Uh, it's a little bit different in every city. It could be public works. It could be Department of Parks and Recreation. It could be transportation. Uh, but this is in stark contrast to there are 750,000 private residential landowners in the five boroughs of New York City. There are 220,000 private residential landowners in Baltimore City, almost a quarter million. So you think each of them has different motivations, capacities, and interests. A lot of my research is also on yard care and why are people planting trees or not planting trees. And so street trees conveniently, uh, uh, it's much more straightforward. It tends to be uh, relatively few, few actors involved. And it's an important part of the urban forest that we have contact with. Zooming into Baltimore City, we've got the, the red line map on the left. A tremendous overplotting of, of the, uh, the street trees. You have a complete street tree inventory, which is fantastic for management and research purposes. So a team effort, my, my colleagues at University of Maryland, Johns Hopkins, Forest Service, and University of Maryland, Baltimore County, published this a few years ago. And uh, so what we did is we divided up these neighborhoods into this honeycomb so that each cell would have the exact same size because we wanted to look at trees within the same size because bigger areas are going to have more of everything, uh, including street trees. And so we want to divide it up into like to like comparisons, apples to apples. And what we did was uh, we had about 90,000, um, uh, sorry, we had about uh, 50,000 uh, trees. And what we, what we did was use uh, what's called a species accumulation curve. And these mathematics are well worked out in ecology and, and uh, landscape ecology. And the way it works is we, we go through and, and um, the number of trees is on the horizontal and the number of tree species is on the vertical. So we take the data set and the first row is a red maple. So now we're down here at one and one. We have one red maple and one tree. And then the second tree also happens to be a red maple. So now we have two trees sampled along the horizontal and we only have one tree species on the vertical. And then let's say uh, the third one is a white oak. Now we've sampled three on the horizontal and we have two on the vertical. And if you keep going through your data set, no matter how much effort you apply, no matter how much sampling you do, you're not going to uncover new species. And so when these lines become horizontal, no new species are discoverable. No matter how much sampling and effort you apply, again, this comes from landscape ecology, you won't uncover new species. Um, when it's horizontal, it's completely saturated. And so what we see here is that in the red line, in, in, in red, in, in D and the C communities have lower species diversity in their street trees than their A and B counterparts. But why does that matter? Well, the street tree species diversity is really important for resilience because the next urban forest pathogen can move tree to tree to tree unchecked if we have all the same host species. So if you have a bunch of elm trees and you have Dutch elms disease, it can go from elm to elm to elm to elm. If we have Asian longhorn beetle and we have lots of um, maple trees, then Asian longhorn beetle, ALB, can go from maple to maple to maple to maple. And so it's kind of like a stock portfolio. Uh, when you have diversity, you're kind of hedging your bets and you have more, uh, more resilience. So we want a mix of species um, so that the next, the next urban forest pathogen is, uh, is less able to spread. And ecologists uh, argue about how to do this. Should we looking, be looking at species richness? 
or a diversity index. And so we did it three different times in three different ways. Um, and what you see is the same pattern that A and B have greater species uh, diversity than C and D, um, no matter how we look at it. And so that's saying that not, that's saying that, you know, in the first study I showed you, A neighborhoods had more tree canopy, all trees when viewed from above, A to B to C to D. And this is saying on a species level in Baltimore city streets, we have a more resilient urban forest because we have more species, we have a more diversified portfolio uh, that's less likely to be affected by, by a pathogen. We can uh, drill down and, and separate our species by size. Older, tree, uh, older trees are more likely to be bigger. It's hard to have large, excuse me, it's hard to have old, small trees. Um, and so we split them into larger than 20 inches in diameter at their, their trunk. And then the newer ones are uh, you know, smaller as a proxy for younger, less than five inches. And what you can see is that there's larger trees and more larger trees in A than B than C than D. So these are more likely to have been planted during the time of redlining. And the smaller trees are more recently planted. But when we look at the smaller trees, we see there's been an enormous amount of planting in C and D neighborhoods. So fast forward 50 years and the trend might be flipped. It might be that all this great investment that's going to formerly C and D neighborhoods uh, through environmental justice programs to increase tree canopy, in part because of our research, uh, might actually flip the, the situation in the future because those trees, uh, larger trees, aren't going to be for, there forever. So that was a little bit about street trees. I just want to pivot briefly to something uh, as more of a research frontier and, and uh, a little bit newer uh, in my research portfolio. Um, this was a great paper published a few years ago now, and it had a bunch of provocative hypotheses. And the idea was, well, if the distribution of parks and open space and tree canopy differs by redlining, A, then B, then C, then D, and I've shown you that it has, we might also have in urban wildlife, different traits um, are different within different um, species. Uh, we might have different species richness, right? Um, so we might have more birds, which eat the insects that live on the trees in A than B than C than D. So if, if, the, uh, if the parks and open space and tree canopy is different from A to B to C to D, we might have different um, kinds of communities. And then we might have entirely different food webs on D, right? In part because of race-based uh, policies like redlining. Looking at uh, uh, citizen science, uh, volunteer collected data um, on birds, we were able to show that not more birds, but more data about birds in A than B than C than D. So there's more birding activity in A than B than C than D. And again, using a species accumulation curve, we were able to estimate what percent of that, that bird community do we think that we've sampled. And so 100% complete would be that horizontal line. And we do see more completeness in A than B than C than D. So um, I'm, I'm working on a multi-species project of birds and insects and, and reptiles and amphibians. And we're seeing that, that actually the birding data is pretty different from the insects and, 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 and so on. Um, and some, some taxa, taxonomic groups do have this and others don't. And mostly we don't have enough data to tell, but this is something I've been really interested in looking at. Elaine asked me to talk a little bit about gentrification. Uh, this is some unpublished work I did like half a decade ago, never went anywhere, but just showing the redlining map, which is now familiar on the left, and um, housing and, and planning in Baltimore City uh, uses a cluster analysis called a housing market topology as letter grades A through J. And the idea is different real estate markets in Baltimore City uh, require different um, interventions or none from the city. So in A and B, 
very low vacancy, strong, robust real estate markets, um, I and J, high, high, high vacancy and, and other problems. And so what I did was I, I restricted the housing market topology to just those neighborhoods that were redlined so we can compare how have cities fared under the redlining system compared to, it's a different method, but another way of categorizing the real estate market in Baltimore City. And what we can see is with what's called the Sankey diagram, Ds don't remain Ds. Some Ds have actually moved up into some of the, the most expensive real estate in, in Baltimore City. And some A's have, have in a sense, downshifted. But the, the key thing here is I've showed you for the last 35 minutes how redlining is a consistent predictor of uh, poor health outcomes and all forms of inequity socially and economically in terms of health, in terms of the built environment like vacancy, in terms of the environment like tree canopy. But it doesn't have to be a recipe for future uh, disinvestment. It doesn't have to lock in those neighborhoods. And the second point to make here is in some cases, these neighborhoods have suffered twice. First, from the disinvestment associated with redlining, and second, from modern gentrification. And so it's, it's dynamic. Redlining um, is, is not a death sentence, in a, in a sense. Neighborhoods do change over time and in, in different ways. So I just wanted to highlight that. I didn't want anybody to walk away with the impression that there's no way to overcome redlining. And I also wanted to highlight um, the risk or potential of, of sort of a double harm of gentrification. So in summary, I've, I've shared with you uh, three studies on tree canopy across 37 cities and redlining. We drilled down into Baltimore City to look at street trees, um, their species, their resilience, um, and then started looking at uh, citizen science bird observations, which is kind of a research frontier for me. Who's doing what and where in terms of documenting living things in built places? And then finally, uh, I wanted to talk about uh, how gentrification and, and green gentrification map onto and, and relate to, to some of these ideas. So thanks for the opportunity to share. I look forward to your questions and I hope we can begin a dialogue. Thanks for your attention. Thank you so much, Dexter. A lot of really great information. Um, and I see a couple of, of things pop up in the Q&A um, and, and still sort of formulating a couple of questions myself as I, as I process all this. Um, so the first question is, um, is there any publication available about the 35 to 40% canopy enhanced benefits analysis, particularly thermal comfort? Uh, yes, I will put that in the chat. Um, excellent. So hopefully um, everyone will have access to that in the chat. Um, not quite sure how that might function in the in the webinar context, but we'll um, if, if anybody has difficulty, accessing that, please uh, put something in the Q&A and, and alert us so we can we can send it out after the fact. Um, let's see, second question here, um, this one from Kathleen Smith uh, saying, I'm curious if you or others have looked at whether the C and D rated neighborhoods that have more investment in recent tree planting are those that are moved up vis-a-vis -vis the housing typology mapping, i.e. the ones that are likely being gentrified. That is a great idea. I'm embarrassed to admit we had not thought of that. Um, the, 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 main, the main colleague I was working on, um, the gentrification piece moved on and, and that's why uh, that, those maps and graphs have sat stale for about five years. But um, that is a great idea. I'm gonna take a screenshot of that question so I can follow up on that. Um, those, those formerly C and D neighborhoods are getting a lot of investments in a number of different ways. I mentioned the vacant building removals. Um, 
Let's tree tree planting. A lot of the vacant building removals are being uh, are turning into community gardens, parks, open space. Um, basement flooding is a problem in Baltimore City, as is in Philly, New York, many many other cities I work in. And a, a good hole is a terrible thing to waste. And so some of these buildings are coming off and the physical depression in the landscape is becoming a stormwater absorbing feature with things like cisterns and, and other methods. And then they're building a park on top that most days of the year, it's very nice to use. And when we do get a deluge and a, a gully washer rain event, um, instead of overwhelming and taxing the gray infrastructure that's aging, that water can safely percolate down and, and they've got all kinds of um, community gardens and, and uh, playgrounds and uh, pavilions and places to meet on top. So that's the type of investment that's incurring. And I'd be remiss if I didn't mention some of the vacant building removal um, programs are, uh, you know, traditional bulldozers, it's two or three people, it's a bulldozer and somebody spraying the, the pile with water to keep the, the dust down. Um, uh, very quick, it employs two to three people uh, and some were doing a workforce development program, crews of eight to 12 that are deconstructing the buildings and using the bricks uh, are being uh, uh, becoming pathways and and, uh, uh, and and turned into walkways and parks are being sold. Some of the boards are being upcycled and repurposed by local artisans and um, making amazing furniture being used in all kinds of different ways, great cabinets and things like that. And so there's a lot less going to the landfill. It's employing more people uh, as a, uh, green job skills training program and, and a recidivism diversion program. And uh, so it's not just that vacant buildings are being removed, it's removing the vacant buildings, it's creating jobs, it's preventing um, materials from going to the landfill, it's repurposing those materials in a fun and engaging way. And there's many, many other co-benefits. Um, uh, so when I say those c &D neighborhoods, are receiving investment, it's really multifaceted and, and, and layered in, in a few ways that I think um, connects to some of the, the programs I heard about from PSC in the beginning. Yeah, thank you. And I, I would uh, just draw any of, of the folks on the lines today's attention um, to the recordings that you can find on our website um, or in the YouTube channel for Just Communities um, of some of our other webinars in the past. And um, the, the one that particularly comes to mind uh, as, as a really exciting model of, of anticipating where these kind of green investments might um, or would likely lead to uh, displacement of legacy residents is the 11th Street Bridge Project in Anacostia um, that we heard, um, heard a great presentation about uh, a couple of months ago. So, uh, so there's some great strategies that, that you can learn um, on the anti-displacement side uh, related to to green gentrification through that project, among many others. Um, I wanna make sure that we get to another question here, uh, Dexter. So Zach Lofton uh, asked if you can re repeat the housing market typology um, piece that you were sharing. Uh, yeah, sure, I, I went a little bit faster. Complexity. Yeah, you may wanna pull that slide back up. I, it was a good image. Oh yeah, yeah, that's a great idea. Um, they, they take, uh, um, they take uh, a handful of characteristics about the housing market topologies, uh, uh, number of days on the market, median sale price, percent vacant, all these things per neighborhood. And they put into a cluster analysis and it derives these, these rank order categories. And so it's, it bears some resemblance to Hulk in that it's many different factors that go into a categorization of neighborhoods. It's a little bit more uh, quantitative and, and, and data-driven in that sense. Um, but unlike deciding where the home loans go, the idea is which neighborhoods today need different strategies? Um, linking back to that last question, which types of investments um, are needed in different environment, uh, different neighborhoods? And in A and B, it's, it's really none. Um, those are... are um, you know, um, neighborhoods that don't require a lot of intervention, whereas
has. Some of these neighborhoods that are maybe on the cusp of uh, increasing vacancy, how to stabilize that housing market, um, and all the way to the neighborhoods that are receiving the most kind of re revitalization through a number of the programs I just mentioned. Um, Baltimore Neighborhood Indicators Alliance had an analysis that showed that once a neighborhood slipped beneath around 5% vacancy, they, they've never really come back from that. That um, once they're below 5% vacancy, they just tend to become more and more vacant. And so that seems to be a critical threshold. So the idea is to take a bunch of data on a median sale price, days on the market, vacancy, things like that, and uh, put them into a statistical cluster analysis, get these categories, and then Department of, of Planning uses them um, to craft different policies and programs in an attempt to aid those neighborhoods in a more um, uh, targeted approach. Excellent. Well, thanks for revisiting that. Um, I actually have a, a question sort of on a, a building on, on some of what you were just sharing. I, you, you have so much great um, insight that comes from this research work. And, and you, you've mentioned, and, you know, the number of different cities that you've been working in um, to, to help to collect and analyze this data. I would would be curious to hear anything about um, maybe examples of of some of the application of this research um, as it relates to policy um, and and sort of the deployment of of some of the urban canopy um, urban community canopy or, or forestry uh, funding streams that are flowing right now. Um, anything that that you see as a as a sort of recommendation maybe or action step that you would encourage folks on the line to, to engage in? Yeah, so like very brief history. So high resolution tree canopy maps were created in Baltimore and a number of other cities with the US Forest Service in close partnership with the University of Vermont and their spatial analysis lab. And that showed how much canopy there is. And you can slice and dice that any way you want in census block groups, watersheds, all the way down to the individual property scale. And in recognition of that, a number of communities started making ambitious investments and canopy goals. I mentioned DC's 40% goal, Baltimore 40% goal, Philadelphia 30% um, per neighborhood. In the case of New York City, they had a STEM goal, Million Trees NYC. I worked on that um, prior to working with the Forest Service. Uh, 30,000 trees in Worcester in response to removing 30,000 trees to Asian longhorn beetle. 10,000 trees in New Haven, and on and on and on. Um, and so we showed how much tree canopy there was and how much was possible. And the communities turned around and made these goals. And then they said, now that we've made these goals, how do we implement that? And so I've worked on tree canopy prioritization. So where are the benefits of trees lacking? Where is it hottest in the summer? Where is the most impervious surface? Where is it flooding? And we can use that as a tool to do a stakeholder engagement process about which organizations have a mission or mandate about that thing, whether it's the health department and extreme heat, or whether it's flooding and Department of Public Works. And then groups came together and say, we might have different reasons, but we actually have the same priority neighborhoods for which trees are part of the mission or mandate. And so that's helped guide some of the top-down city planning. And then we've been working a lot with NGOs and community groups um, in different cities on tree giveaways. They say, well, if your research shows that high income areas have more tree canopy, they do, uh, than their lower income counterparts. And if communities of color have less tree canopy than their predominantly white communities, which we have seen because of this high resolution tree canopy data. So at the neighborhood level, this environmental injustice, and one of the most clear and consistent findings in all the cities we've worked in is that most of the land is private residential most of the tree canopy is on private residential. And most of the opportunities for additional tree canopy are also on private residential. So if we converted all of our parks and open space in Baltimore City to tree canopy and made every street a green tunnel, we still can't get to 40% canopy because we need private residential land. And so that nobody wants to turn our soccer fields and baseball diamonds into forest anyway. So we need to understand the motivations, capacities, and interest of private residential landowners. So at the neighborhood scale, these environmental injustices, and at the parcel scale, it's all about residences, re residential land. So a number of cities started giving free trees away. 
And we did some analysis and the free trees went to the high income neighborhoods that had the most tree canopy already. Uh, in, the, in the intervening 10 or 12 years since I've written a number of those reports, my natural resource management colleagues, NGOs, city agencies have dramatically altered their outreach strategies. And now I'm working with a very capable undergraduate student as part of a senior thesis uh, is analyzing where have the free trees gone since those programs have been modified. So that's a little bit a snapshot of this cycle of the science, the pilot. So tree canopy data, canopy goals, how do we implement them? Prioritization, where do we, uh, where do we plant private residential land? How about giveaways? Where are the giveaways going? And so there's been this sort of leapfrogging of the science and technology with the policy and management that has been some of the most rewarding work I've been able to do. Oh, that's so exciting. Well, I we, we could dive into this for hours more. I'm sure I have lots of uh, things that I'd love to pick, pick your brain about on, on this topic. Um, but I know we are uh, about at our time. I do want to lift up. There was one uh, final uh, comment and resource dropped into the Q&A uh, that looks like another, another good piece to uh, add to our repertoire. Um, just can't thank you enough, Dexter, for, for making the time to be with us and share this great work. Um, I know it's going to be thought provoking for many folks on this line today. And, um, and so we will, uh, we will be available if folks want to, uh, to reach out to us with follow up questions or um, make sure that you can get some contact information. I know that Dexter has dropped uh, his email into the chat, but I'm not positive if that is viewable by all. So we'll, we'll help to facilitate um, follow-up conversations. Uh, I do want to make sure that you all know um, we have the save the date uh, for our next webinar, August 28th. Uh, and we're really excited to be welcoming PSC's Yes for Equity uh, Youth Power Building team to, uh, to share some lessons in how you can engage youth in your equity and resilience um, efforts within your community. So I uh, hope that y'all all plan to put that on your calendar and stay tuned. We'll, we'll be getting the registration link out shortly. Um, thank you again, Dr. Locke. It's been a pleasure being with you all. You have a great rest of the day and uh, we'll be in touch.